the new developments of the last 10 years in artificial intelligence are starting to reshape the world, the economics, the business, etc. This is the Talent Show, a new podcast series from FT Talent, a hub of innovation from the Financial Times, hosted by under 30s for the under 30s around the world. This first series is in partnership with Bocconi University, a leading higher education institution of business and managerial advancements. I am Virginia Stagni, and this is the guide you need to drive innovation and change. Today, we are focusing on artificial intelligence by talking with an expert who researches the forefront of technology capabilities. This is for any listener who wants to better understand AI applications in business, where the field of AI is heading, and what breakthroughs may be right around the corner. Here is our conversation with Mark Mezard, professor of the Department of Computing Sciences at Bocconi University. Thank you very much, Mark, for being with us today. Very nice to see you today and have this discussion. Very nice to have you on the talent show. The topic that we would like to explore with you today is something that has been a bit of a buzzword every time that we are thinking about what are the new jobs the next generation is interested in. And definitely looking at AI from your point of view and the fact that in the business school in Milano, there is this attention to AI. It's such a pleasure to learn from your experience and from uh, any tips you might give to our young listeners out there that are interested in building a career in AI. I'm sure that there are many of them who are interested in that. We'll try to answer their questions. I would love uh, to know more about your personal journey. How did you get into this field? Oh, I got into this field because I am a theoretical physicist working on complex systems. So complex system is a collective behavior of systems which have many, many components. And in some sense, you have a complex system when the total is more than the sum of the individuals. So I was working actually, for instance, with a, a lot with Giorgio Parisi, who got the Nobel Prize in Physics last year, and who, who has written these books about uh, storms, these flights of birds, how they coordinate, how they move, and how the collective motion is much more than just the sum of the individual flights. So I came from that. And then at some point, already starting in the 80s, we went into the collective coding of information, how information can be encoded in a collective uh, system in which you have many single elements, how information emerges, how can this be treated. That was the very beginning of what was called neural networks. It has had period which was more silent, but in the last 10 years or so, this is a big boom of artificial intelligence. It's based precisely on this collective uh, monitoring and treatment of information. How did you start your research? Oh, I can tell you, I, I started in theoretical physics, trying to understand the properties of very strange materials, which are glasses. Glass is a very strange material. You do not realize that because you have seen glasses everywhere. It is special in the sense that if you zoom on a glass, you see the molecules that build the glass. But in general, in a solid, the molecules, they are very well ordered. They are well aligned. And that's a crystal or that's a metal. In a glass, they are disordered, like you would find in a liquid, but they do not flow like in a liquid. They do not move around. So I tried to understand that. I went to Rome to work with Giorgio Parisi on these kind of things, and we made big progress. At some point, we realized that the ideas that we were developing, that were really ideas that have to do with how you describe these molecules in a glass, each of them is different from all the other ones. Each of them sees a different environment. So it's like a very complicated society, you know, made of billions of small molecules, each different and each reacting differently. And we realized at some point that it could be used to study some problems in very different fields in biology, in computer science. And I decided to move my activity towards computer science and especially the branch of computer science, which has to do with how information can be processed in an assembly of a lot of very simple elementary tools like artificial neurons. And that was the beginning of neural networks. And these neural networks, they have become now the big tool of artificial intelligence. I found myself in this story very happy to be there. 
In terms of succeeding generally in AI, do you think that you need a PhD today? Well, it depends what you mean by succeeding in AI. I think there are really several fronts of AI at the moment. It is obvious to everybody that the new developments of the last 10 years in artificial intelligence, they are starting to reshape the world, the economics, the business, etc. And so there will be need for people who have some knowledge of what AI can do this will be needed at all levels, in all kinds of jobs. And then there is a, another frontier in some sense, which is where do you develop the new tools or the research around AI? This is uh, technical, it's uh, mathematics, physics, statistics, etc. And for this, certainly, yes, you need a PhD and you need more than a PhD. You need a few years of research. If we had to give a bit of more theoretical definition of what we mean by AI, would you mind explaining in very simple terms what do we mean today for AI? Well, I will focus on one aspect of AI, which is really the one that has been expanding so much and which is triggering this revolution that we see in the last 10 years. This is called machine learning. Machine learning is uh, you are given a certain task, typically a cognitive task. That is, you see some images. On the images, you are asked, what is there on this image? Is there, in the simplest case, when asked someone, is there a cat or is there a dog? People have tried to write by hand some computer programs in order to do that. You know, they were trying to see if there is some special feature that is a cat or a dog, etc. And it never worked really well. And the new tool is machine learning. Machine learning is just you let the machine learn by itself. That is, you present a big database of images of cats with the label cat and images of dogs with the label dog. And you have a machine which has a lot of instructions, but the instruction, they are not in order. They, be, they are kind of random at the beginning. And the machine gradually will make the instruction one by one fit in such a way that it does very well on all the database that you have given it. And then it becomes a smart machine that is able to identify cats and dogs. So that is the typical treatment of the machine learning. It's a big revolution in the sense that you use machine, you do not give yourself all the instruction, you just give the instruction to the machine how you can learn. And then the machine learns from a large database of examples. And this has been applied to image recognition, image segmentation, speech recognition, automatic translation. The number of applications is enormous. It's growing every day. What do we still don't understand about AI and about the AI field? Is still something that we need more research on and then maybe you're mentoring and inspiring your students and your students to pursue? Oh, yes. This is a very interesting question. What we are seeing at the moment, what I have tried to describe briefly, is technological revolution. It is already there. We can see its application. There are incredible tasks. I was talking about translation, about identification of images, but identification of images means also the ability to have self-driving cars or things like that. This, we see all the technology which is really going forward. At the same time, the real understanding of what is happening in AI, in modern AI devices, is still missing. So it means that when you have this machine that has learned a task by looking at a myriad of examples, and then it, it does well, you can measure how good it does on a new task, and you find it does well. But there is no explanation. The machine cannot tell you, I think that this is a cat because this and that and that. The machine cannot tell you, I have decided to translate this sentence from the French to the English in this way because of this context. It does not know that because the machine does not have this information. And so this question of explainability of the decision of the machine, I think it will be very important for the future of applications because when you start to have applications which have a direct impact on the public, the people need to understand on what basis a decision has been made. If you have a recommendation system that help company to hire some new employees, for instance, this already exists. If you feed in with a CV and it answers by ranking the CVs and saying this, 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 this. That's something. But if there is no explanation behind this ranking, 
it's a very weak way of doing things. We need to have explanatory tools. And the explanation is very far away at the moment. And because the theory is lagging behind, we have had a, a technological breakthrough, but the theory is lagging behind. So we need much more research in math, in theory on these devices. That is also very important in order to give some guarantee, a guarantee that it will not go crazy. If you have a, a self-driving car, which is a, analyzing images based on some AI a device for analyzing images, you would like the car will not do something completely crazy if it finds a situation that it has never encountered. I don't know, you're driving and there is an earthquake. Well, the car has never seen that. I don't know how it will react, but certainly I do not want the car to do something completely crazy if this happens. So... The fact of having a theoretical understanding, it means being able to explain what is taking place in the machine. It means being able to give some guarantee that it will not go in a completely crazy uh, situation. It's about the critical thinking point, right? And it's how do you can input that into a more advanced technology is something that it's quite interesting, even from a, the decision making process, but as well, like when we're looking, for example, at news and new tools that we can use in the newsroom in deciding what you should know every day. And the kind of selection and filtering of news is still something that we believe it should be and could be human centered because the technology doesn't do yet the job of a critical thinker that is normally part of the newsroom. And that's been a huge debate, for example, when it comes to how does it look like the newsroom of the future or a media group of the future. It's so interesting that when I joined the Financial Times, it was a year where we just started an experiment of having, a, you know, a little AI tool, allow me to say so, that was trying to recognize images on our paper to try to understand if we were balanced and equal in getting men and women and as well diversity in our pictures. And it was interesting to see that sometimes the machine made a few mistakes. The Financial Times engineers tried to give a color as well of the emotions on this picture. Is it a sad man or is it a happy woman? Try really to balance a bit the sentiment around genre and diversity. Something very tangible for me and pragmatic because it was giving recommendations to the newsroom on the images to use. Have you seen something that made you excited about your field in terms of very pragmatic applications that maybe you would like to share with our talent show listener? Mm -hmm. Well, what I would like to say is that at the moment, there is something very important taking place, which is that AI really these days, these months, is becoming more and more important in science itself. It is having an impact on scientific discoveries. For instance, there has been this program called AlphaFold that was developed in the recent years. AlphaFold is a, a computer program based on AI, which is able to take a sequence of a protein and tell you what will be the shape of the protein. So the protein is a molecule. The molecule is made of some basic amino acids. These amino acids, they come in 20 letters. Okay, so you have 20 of them. So you have a letter for each of them. And so you have a text, which is just a one line, a long line, gives you the sequence of letters. And this text, we were not really able to read it well. It required an enormous effort. And now we have a tool in which you give the text and the output of the text will tell you, this is a molecule that is done like this and like that. And it will expose this site and this site can bind to something else and it can have that action. It looks like nothing, but has a tremendous impact on all biochemistry. And biochemistry, it means developing new drugs for medicine. I mean, when you have a good protein that is able to bind to something, that's exactly the process by which you develop a new drug. We are just at the moment where we are able to read this book. So we read the book of proteins. So it's a very exciting moment. It's something that we didn't know. It's as if we had a language. Of course, we knew the basic rules, etc. But from these basic rules, we were not able, by reading the book, to know what it will be able to do. And we are about to do that at the moment. It is like we are learning a new language. This, learning, this new language will allow us to read the great book of life. So it is a fascinating moment. And I picked that example in biochemistry because I think that it is a very 
big uh, issue. It's uh, scientifically, it's really an important progress. But when can see the impact of uh, artificial intelligence development in many other areas. I was discussing very recently with colleagues who are in chemistry and they are trying to build new materials, porous materials that will be able to absorb CO2. So if you absorb the carbon dioxide, you know, it's something that is very important for the future of the planet, other which will be able to absorb hydrogen. Having hydrogen, which is stored on a solid in a very efficient way, is also the key for having green cars that will work only with hydrogen. So there is a lot of science to be developed on which you can rely on a lot of data because there have been many studies. But, you know, the number of materials that could be synthesized and tested, they are enormous. So you cannot do that. Each time it's a very long work of chemistry to synthesize a piece of new material that nobody has seen. So if you can predict with artificial intelligence, look, synthesize this one, the one that has this composition, probably that will be one that will be a very good absorbent for hydrogen. So it changes a lot of the science developments and the technological developments. We say at the Financial Times that the great catalyst in our change has been in the distribution side. And definitely data had an enormous, huge role. Being able to understand our readers, to understand our customers, made us do different editorial and business decisions and take certain directions. We then say, and we actually read this quite a lot, that information is the new oil in capitalism. Do you agree with this? What are the questions that capitalists should start thinking when they are managing data? And I think let's raise uh, the ethical question and uh, how, from your side, how can you influence ethical decision making or at least stimulate the conversation around ethics and data? Okay, first, uh, yes, information is a new oil. It is, it is a very nice statement. I think it is partly true, but I would like to complement it with something. If you have more information, it means more data, it means more capacity to be able to do, to address a customer with um, more precise, uh, uh, with what um, the customer might want to, to, to get, etc., etc. So you are more powerful when you have more data available, if you are able to treat the data. So the new artificial intelligence is able to treat large amount of data kind of. It's able to treat it in the sense that it's able to answer relatively simple questions, not very complicated questions. I have one caveat that I want to emphasize, which is important also. I am a physicist, and in physics there is something which is very important, which is the energy. The energy is conserved. And so oil is energy. As we know, oil and gas are energy that we use every day. We know it so well. And so Information is wonderful. Information is much more linked to another aspect of thermodynamics, which is called entropy. And that's a long story. But the energy will not disappear. The energy problem will not disappear because we have more information. Not at all. We will always need energy. And in fact, the thing which is very impressive is that we have seen in recent years all this progress of machine learning. They are based on what? They are based on larger database more and more computation. And the amount of computing power that is dedicating to AI is increasing very rapidly. The amount of energy, of electricity that one uses in order to develop these new algorithms of machine learning is increasing very fast also. And we will reach a saturation at some point because of that, because of the energy. It will come back. It will bounce back. So certainly that is a direction of research that I like a lot which is parsimonious machine learning. How is one able to develop new machine learning algorithms, new machine learning devices, tools, ideas that are not relying on the fact that you have 10 billion data, but that you have much less data, but you exploit them in a smarter way. And so that is parsimonious learning. I think it's, it's a very interesting research direction because we will hit this frontier of the size of database that at some point becomes unmanageable just from the point of view of energy consumption.
One question for you, and I hope Visa comes across in the right way, because I want to make Visa a bit relatable to people like me that try to code a few times, trying to learn how to do it, and they failed. So for the people that are a bit more developed on the right brain, how they can learn to at least understand the tools and get more hands on in the AI field, what would you suggest them to do? Uh, that's not an easy question. I'm not sure I have the answer to that. I am impressed that you, you try to code by yourself. I'm not sure this is really the only solution. Although the exercise of coding in itself is rather interesting because uh, any example of people who try to code, in general, the first try, you make a mistake, it does not work. It does not produce what you expect it to produce. At least that's what happens to me after decades and decades and decades of coding. So it's still true. So you learn at least something. You learn that there is a language there which is very precise and which needs to be very well uh, tuned. Then there is a machine learning and the machine learning has this incredible flexibility in the sense that uh, you realize that when the machine learns by itself, it finds all these database or this correlation, etc., and makes a prediction based on that. This is much more robust. This is much more flexible. You can have made some small mistake. You can have a wrong data somewhere, etc. It will still make the job because it averages over a large number of data. So there is this kind of law of large numbers that will help it to correct its own mistakes. So that is something that is very striking of the new development. Now, how can one get an idea of that? I think that one should be very lucid about what are these machines doing. People have tried to explain in terms which are not technical how they work. I think it's very useful to open a little bit the black box. When I give a public lecture on artificial intelligence, I start with the two population of the colleagues, the ones who say it will change the world for the good and the ones who say it will be a catastrophe and it will destroy the world. Then I explain all the incredible new results that have been obtained and the reading of the book of the life and the proteins, etc., etc. And then I have always a section opening the black box. I think that in some sense, not going to the, to the stage in which you are able to code an AI device, people who, who have a little bit of um, education and curiosity, they can have an idea of how it works. It's relatively easy. You can imagine that you have a machine and this machine, it has thousands, actually millions of small buttons. And these buttons, they will tell you instruction of the machine. The traditional way was I have to find the right direction for each of these buttons. There are many, many combinations and they have to think and find the program and that adapts all these things. And in machine learning, it's completely the contrary. You start with your buttons in completely random position. It's a mess, it does not do anything. You present image, it tells you a nonsense at the exit. And then you start to say, well, if I turn this knob here a little bit to the left, I present the image again, does it do a better job? It does, I leave it there, I try another button, and you do that. And gradually, after billions of tries, it will do it. So I think that having this idea in mind is already something. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing this. Now, some of the challengers, so the students and early career professionals that took part in the past editions of the FT Talent Expo Coney Challenge are coming to the show to ask some questions. So we have Jean and Helen for you. And Jean, I know you are here with your questions, so over to you. Hello, my name is Jean Tsverga. I was a participant of the FT Talent Challenge in 2022. I grew up in France and Germany, but I currently live in Singapore, where I'm working in a fintech on solving some of the industry's ESG data challenges. My question to Professor Mark Mazar is the following. Growing capabilities of AI tools have the potential to redefine our occupations. Think of DALI 2 and graphic designers, for instance. What key strengths should humans develop from a professional perspective to find relevance in a new AI-driven environment? Thank you, Professor Mark Mazar. I look forward to hearing your insights. 
Thank you, Jean, for this excellent question. As I was describing, AI is presently reshaping the world and it creates a lot of interrogations to the young generation. What will, will these jobs still exist in the future or not? I think there is a kind of generic answer that I would like to give. I will not address specific cases, let's say. But I think that one should be able to do, first of all, is realize how important it is in present time to have a training that allows you to change orientation, to be able to modify your work program and schedule. And then the second point, which is important also, is um, have this background that is a background that allows you to understand how data can influence or not the job that you are doing. That is, if you can foresee that there is there a lot of data and there is the, the new oil, as it was mentioned by Virginia before, that in your field, data is becoming very important, then that is a good signal. And it's a signal that it's something that will maybe reshape your activity. I think that the young people like Jean, they are able to take it and become not just someone who suffers from it, but someone who is a motor of this evolution. Thank you very much. And the last question is from Helen. Hello, my name is Helen Poon and I was a participant of the FT Talent Challenge in 2021 and I live in London. I'm currently transitioning from investment banking to working in the group M&A and strategy team at the Financial Times. My question to Professor Mark Mazurt is, with tools such as PseudoWrite available to students to write essays and text to image generators like Midjourney and Dal E too available to artists, where should we draw the line between effectively utilizing AI and what is considered cheating? Should use of AI be allowed in competitions of art and literature? Thank you very much. I look forward to hearing what you think. Uh, what a nice question. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. First of all, well, there are two things. There is a question of cheating, which is something that one should certainly avoid at the maximum. There is a good way to, to use these tools. The good way is to mention it. There is nothing wrong in citing even long pieces of papers that have been done before, provided you mention it. If you use them and cite them without mentioning it, it becomes problematic. But if you look at a large part of literature, a large part of literature is built in a reaction to previous literature and often with the citations, which are not always explicit, I should say, but sometimes they are. And so it is a motor of the world. A motor of the world is to take pieces of what has been done before, incorporate it in what you are doing, and then elaborating on it. Research works like that. Scientific research works like that also. We are building up on the papers of other people that they have recently published. We have read them. It has inspired me, etc. The point is a question of giving the correct quote. Again, there is no, absolutely nothing wrong in quoting someone. Now, if what you ask is, is it fair to take an artificial program that will generate your essay and to give that to your teacher, this, I think, it is absolutely clearly very unfair. It deprives you from the very nice experience of writing yourself an essay. And the point is not so much in general in the result, which is the essay itself, but the process of writing it, which is the one that empowers you and that helps you to develop your skills. Professor Mezzard, thank you very much for today. Thank you for all your insights and thanks for sharing with us your journey as well as your expertise. I really hope you enjoyed our time together today. It was definitely a great learning experience for myself and I bet for all our listeners out there. So thank you very much. I cannot appreciate more your time. Thanks a lot, Virginia. It was a great pleasure to discuss with you. If you're a listener of Italian Show, I bet you're quite interested in the world of work and in understanding trends that are shaking up workplaces worldwide today. I recommend you to check out Working It, the FT's workplace podcast and newsletter. 
Join our friend and host Isabel Berwick every Wednesday for understanding the big ideas shaping work today and the whole habits we need to leave behind. Tune in, subscribe and follow. This has been The Talent Show, which is produced by the FT Talent Team, Aya Al-Shihabi, Noor Hafez, and me, Virginia Stagni. Our podcast producer is Todd Van Leuling. Our editor and sound engineer is Arturo Ochoa. Our video producer is Enrique Zecca. And our social media producer is Letizia Clementi. Our music is by Dennis Kishuk. Check out all of the Talent Show episodes at fttalent.ft.com. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and follow FT Talent on socials for updates. Until next time and keep listening.